Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Podcast. With me today is the usual crew, Murray Dom, Mark DeSantis, Mark McCaffrey, and Mike Cole. It's lots of M's today, except me. My name is Jasper Orthuis. I'm the editor of Ancient Warfare Magazine. And today we're going to talk about the newest issue of the magazine, issue 16.2, which talks about hoplites. It's a topic we've done before, but there's there's more to say, and, and things that you could say about it have probably changed since the last time that we talked about hoplites, because I think the rise of the hoplite was... Murray, you probably, you, you have the archive in, in your head, probably uh, issue me. six, six, is it six one? About a decade ago. And we've talked about Othesmos many times in the magazine. Um, so we're not doing that today. Um, maybe, sure. maybe today we should just, <laughs> we should we just, might. we should just we start might. with what is a hoplite? Let's start with the basic. I mean, this seems like a, a very basic thing to begin with, but it does bear repeating is we need to, to, because I still keep seeing it, we need to disabuse the hoplon, right? Because the shield ter- termination is the aspis. And and the opla is the full panoply, right? And this can be misleading, but the, but I, I really think the term is because it's 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 a it's a political social term as well as a military one. It's basically saying that the person who is enfranchised enough to supply the gear so that they can be a member of the boulet to vote. Um, which sort of links it to the to the political reforms that that brought about the phalanx. And I know that Roel is going to cut my head off when he hears me saying these things, but I really genuinely do believe them. So it really is the core heavy infantryman that dominates the end of the archaic period into the beginning of the Hellenistic, uh, not just in Greece, by the way, but sort of in the Mediterranean basin, in the Hellenic tradition, I think is probably the only accurate way to say it. But the danger here is to to view this as a static image, right? That it's one thing. And this is one of the points I made in my piece is that we have this kind of mental image of a, I want to say late uh, or rather early fifth century BC figure with the, the, the linothorax thorax or the, or the, the muscled cuirass, the greaves, the bare arms, the, the Corinthian pattern helmet, uh, and the dory and the aspis, which, by the way, are really the only requirement. That rest of the stuff, you, you don't have to have that. Um, and and that, uh, that static image of the hoplite, which has really been popularized both by Hollywood and video games, is, is a snapshot in time and not accurate. And, and, and what you instead have is this organically evolving both military and sociopolitical entity um, that forms both the, the political and, and military core of, of Greek life in this period. Would you, is, that, is that fair? Which politics are you talking about, though? Because you, yeah, you get that, exactly. You get that um, every time you keep saying political revolution, and I think that goes back to Aristotle. But again, he's more talking about Athenian politics and whether that brings in a democratic aspect. But of course, that wouldn't apply to everybody. Um, so, can we clarify that? Well, so so when I say politics, I just mean I mean the uh, right. I don't necessarily mean democratic, but I mean the polis entity. Should I say demos instead? Uh, you know, but my yeah. point is, yeah. but my point is, is that is that there are people. These people are bounded by a shared identity. Um, I mean, everyone has the shared language and the shared tradition. But because remember, the hoplite is not unique to Athens, right? There are there are like mm-hmm. a hoplites. There are Theban hoplites. There are Corinthian hoplites. There are hoplites all over. Uh, there are Persian hoplites. I'd like to point out, right? There are Ionian and, uh, hoplites. There are Thracian hoplites. So, but in that case, the you know, Carian and the P- Persian hoplites, or even the examples, I think you can sort of extend the term even to the Egyptian um, warfare as such being hoplites. Does that still fit with the de- definition when you're saying demos hoplite, and then saying, but actually you're chucking them into other theaters as well? Oh, careful, Mark. Can- I'm, I'm in danger of being wrong. <laughs> I hate being wrong. I think the fact is that the, the hoplite becomes so dominant in warfare that it becomes copied by other cultures who see its superiority as a, as a, as a fighting style, and therefore you do get Carthaginian hoplites, you get Egyptian hoplites, you get Persian hoplites, the Kardakes. So I think there is a, there is a, a, a natural evolution of the Greek Magna Graeca Greek general, you know, even further north in areas that might not be considered Greece, adopting hoplites. And then there is imitative uh, hoplites around it, which come later, but they're still hoplites. So it's kind of a question of when is a hoplite not a hoplite? When is a hoplite actually a hoplite? The panoply, uh, panoply of the hoplite that made the hoplite, or was it the hoplite fighting in the phalanx, whether or not he was using the weapons typically associated with the hoplite ah, that made him? 
Mike just reduced the hoplite to essentially what you need is the auspice and the spear. Now, we assume that to be a soldier in that time, you needed a pokey stick of some kind. So the spear is sort of a given. So what is the, you know, what what is it about the auspice that makes a hoplite? Yeah, because actually you go back before the hoplite, and I think, you, you know, that term only comes in in, what, um, 470, 475, 470. Um, and, of course, before that, you've got the Dora Forest, um, or Dora, Dora Foray, uh, sorry, bad grammar there, um, essentially your spear carrier. So, yeah. therefore, is there a, you know, specifically the aspis that, brings in the terminology i know as as much as you started by saying the shield is not the hoplon and so therefore we can't do the old deodora siculus i think it is gives us that definition um but is there something about the aspis that gives us the definition of the hoplite is it the size of the shield the large round shield which has uh made it possible in the so-called phalanx formation that allowed one soldier to provide protection not only for himself but for a nearby soldier that 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 is the the large uh, the the size of the shield meant that if you got packed together you would have, have more protection uh for others and that just made the phalanx formation all the more useful so so this was this is something i wanted to say when you asked your question mark is that if you say the the phalanx you know uh, the stella of vultures has a phalanx on it right you have sumerians now it's not a round aspis style shield but that's unquestionably a phalanx. And remember, if, if, if the whole point of a phalanx, and I maintain this in in, in a Legion versus ph- uh, phalanx, uh, sorry, I don't mean to tell uh, top my own work, but I do, uh, is that it's designed to be simple, right? If you're a farmer and you're grabbing your old dad's rusty spear when you when you, when the city calls you out to fight once in a long time, it's real simple to line up to the guy next to you, point the spears in one direction, overlap shields and march. If, if that's what we believe in, the hoplite can be viewed as an evolution right? From, from that form. So it's a really good question. Is the shape of the aspis itself? And, the, and remember, when we say the shape, we don't just mean the ability to cover the man to your, oh boy, is it the left? Oh my gosh, it's the left, You're right? Right. It's the, right. I'm so old. This is terrible. All right. Everybody forgive me. You can protect your own left with your aspis, but- No, I knew that. I knew that, Maria. I just want to see if you knew. I want to see if you knew. <laughs> Great job. It's the concave nature of the bowl, which allows you to rest it on your skeleton, right? Which is important because that allows you to add more weight. So you don't need that wicker shield that the Persians and Thracians are using. Um, and, uh, and the Argive grip, of course, which is uh, a, a major innovation. So that's a really great question. I mean, the other thing, of course, is Homer uses the phalanx, as does, I don't know that Tertius uses the term, but he certainly seems to be describing what we would think is a phalanx. But is it? And I think that's one of the issues. And Tertius says overlap shields, doesn't he? Yes, yes. But then again, if you have a bunch of people standing close by, the terminology of, of many of the phalanx terms would be natural terms. You know, if you're standing side by side, which is, you know, uh, what warfare is right up until, the you know, the birth of the 20th century, it's kind of a phalanx and it is a hedgehog pike of the bayonets or pike or whatever. So the interesting thing is the evolution of, of what a hoplite is and what, you know, what what determines a hoplite because one of the other things of course uh and it was a big controversy a few years ago is that early hoplites have throwing spears because they have multiple spears they see proto hoplites yeah so they see well well are they proto hoplites they still have a spear they still have an aspis they they fit the criteria just they throw their spears which is like wait what so i think the issue is that we've come down into a a 20th 21st century it's a definition and it doesn't ever evolve and it doesn't ever change Whereas I don't think that the terminology is so locked in that it didn't mean different things in different city states and in different you know areas of of the ancient Mediterranean. So you know, and we get that with with supposedly very specific terms like lochos, and it's like yes, but a Spartan lochos, Athenian lochos, a, you know, and uh, and a, a Theban lochos, they're different sizes of men. So Lokos does not mean Lokos. Lokos means, well, where are we exactly? You know, a bit like Obo, you know. Uh, so, and I think the problem is that when you're defining what a hoplite is by a piece of equipment that we've identified in the archaeological record that isn't necessarily firmly identified, even though that's the way the academics have presented it, and we still see that, Corinthian helmets. It's like, is it Corinthian? Or is it the fact that the first one was found in Corinth? Oh right. Well, no. Yes. Herodotus. Herodotus calls it Corinthian, straight up. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that they're not. But I'm just saying that you know the Argive shield is it Argive? 
is the is you know the Illyrian helmet. Is it Illyrian? Well, the Illyrian helmet's not. Like, yeah. So so the problem with typologies like that is that they become enmeshed in, in you know enshrined in mythology. No, I, I, I agreed, Murray. I mean, and that's something that we've come back to many times. That you know you can't trust what the authors write, and you know. Uh, you know, is a pilomet different than a from a thrusting spear or uh, whatever? But we just started by saying that the hoplite is is something that is spreads across the Mediterranean um, within Hellenistic culture and and without. So clearly, everybody understood something by that term and and started copying it or not or or is that uh, so? What are they copying? So what is the essential the essential hoplite that they're copying or or are they just you know uh, copying the flavor so it looks good I mean it could it could also be you know there's prestige attached to it too and and you're just copying what it looks like and that's fine I mean I think that's one thing that we definitely have sort of forgotten in modern warfare is that we live in a world in which socio political status is really held by entertainers and journalists. And it's been a long time since we really revered warriors in the way that, that they were in the ancient world. But that, but your, your battlefield presence, including your appearance, that was your political identity, right? It was your social identity. So there's a lot of that. I, mean, I think I, you could argue that certainly in the U.S., veterans – are get a social identity yeah but but not but not from our battlefield presence right like so yeah you're john mccain what made john mccain this celebrated senator not that these pictures of him on the battlefield with a, a six-foot crest or like posing with his machine but it's sort of like the story of him having been a pilot in a pow but you see precious little imagery other than like maybe him in a flight suit it's not the same as it's funny though because a lot of people who were not military, whether it be Saddam Hussein or, or, or others, I'll keep that anonymous, who present themselves as warriors, who, who were never warriors. You know, here they are holding a rifle. And you're like, you've never served. So, so I'm just wondering, as, as the non-Greek um, specialist here, just kind of like the casual observer, is that really when, when you're looking at the Hoplite's army, you're effectively looking at non-professional organisations and when you've got other polis, for example, around Magna Graecia and so on, I mean, basically every male citizen potentially can be a warrior. And, and I presume what they do is they buy on the open market what's made. And the stuff that's available is the big shield and stuff. And in fact, if I've got this correct, hop light or hop lawn actually just simply means kit or stuff. Um, you know, well, hop lawn, hop lawn, hop lawn is this, is this, I don't know. It's the uh, plural. Yeah. Hop lawn is the singular hop lawn. Plural. Yeah, so so it's panoply in a funny kind of corrupted way. Um, so so it, so what I'm suggesting is in 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 society where everybody potentially can be carrying shield, spear, queer ass, the rest of it, um, it is a different relationship and engagement, and and therefore reverence to people who are successful at it than in a society like we have, where we have professionals, and we tend to regard professional, as you said, celebrities, actors, lawyers, business people, better than we would somebody wearing camo. I think it, de it it depends, and it's really interesting to look at wars being fought at this time where that is changing, uh, where the the attitude is is in a way reverting to the way that the the demos would have seen their 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 hoplite warriors. But the funny thing is also that when we talk demos, we generally think of Athens, where where you've got this equality of political status, and you're like, well, a no, because that's not Athens, and b there are more non-Athenian uh, demoi than who are also hoplites than Athens. And so the status of a hoplite in Sparta, the status of a hoplite in Argos, the status of a hoplite in Thebes is different and yet similar, and yet they don't have the same sociopolitical status or role that we assume from an Athenian bias in the sources. So again, when you look at the, the elite units that each of these cities have, so Argos has the the Pentalochoi, Thebes has the sacred Theban band, uh, and you know those sorts of things. You do have a, a professionalization, for lack of a better term, but they're an interesting because they are they augment the militia aspect of everyone fighting as a hoplite, which is your farmers going out and you know on a Saturday doing drill, and yet at the same time you have a respect in the sources of those formations that can do the same thing that the militias do, just they do it better and they do it more efficiently. Yeah, it's their high-pass piss or their seals. And I think, Murray, help me with the Greek. It's epilecticoi. 
or epilectoi. Pick it means selected, right? Yeah. Picked. Uh, which a general is that is that right, Mark? Is yeah. The general term. And Lindsay, um, one thing I just to bring it back to Rome because I know that's your that's your specialty. It's not so different from the Polybian Legion, right? Is that you have self generated wealth requirements that place you in the hastati, the the principes, or the or the triari? Well, there's age five five. Yeah, but there's age old oh, with the rari or the whatever or the the the, the wellites, but. Some of that is with age in the Polybian Legion as well, but but there is like but there's a democratic wealth division that connects to your political rights in the Republic and your social status, so your ability to get married, what kind of a wife you're going to get, what kind of a where you're going to wind up in the cursus norm, correct? Right. That so it's it's not that different, I would imagine. Yeah, but I think but I think my point was the fact that in our society we have sectioned off military people, not only physically in terms of the bases. And I mean, you know, we have one 200 miles up the road from I-35. You know, and it is a separate self-contained community with barriers on the gate. Nobody can just wander in. Whereas in, in the ancient world, by and large, until you get to professional Augustan style legions and stuff. So, so what I'm saying is, is that the relationship between the hero, eroi, for example, in Greek, is uh, is different because what they're saying is these are the the best of what we could be. And isn't the arete, which is the, the whole idea of excellence, right? So, so what effectively is that the ordinary Greek citizen, male, right, can aspire to perfection in those kinds of things, and it's expressed as, as military, and that's the one outlet for it. Whereas we don't. We give cups and you know gold figurines to people who act as great stars on TV or landlords or whatever your profession is. And, and the funny thing is, of course, sports. Uh, yes, and yes, the, yes. The weird, the weird thing about a lot of sports is that they have co-opted military imagery, that they're heroes. You're like, you get paid to throw a ball, dude. You're not a hero as such. But uh, but the funny thing is that, you know, that will upset people because they are heroes. You're like, they're not heroes. They're, you know, what is a hero? You know, that, that weird idea. You know, the mother who gives up their career to raise children that's heroic sorry um you know that's that's way more heroic than than you know even anyway so but the problem with that of course is that that adlecting of the of the imagery is something we still do and and but the ancient sources also skew us towards yeah our great heroes like hang on the most famous man in your city was an actor you ran around after a chariot driver you rioted in constantinople and destroyed the palace because the Greens lost a race. So, A, don't tell us all about this pure military imagery. You were just as, just as you know, wowed by a pretty face. You know, you lost a thousand ships for a girl. So, you know, you're, you're just all of that stuff is the same, and yet they kind of love painting this picture of, oh, we're this, and you're like, you're hey, that Murray, too. In defense, in defense of the Greens and the Blues, uh, just a, a brief moment, they saved Constantinople from Attila. They rebuilt the walls, remember, when the earthquake took them down. So sometimes they help. Soccer hooligans, soccer hooligans save you know, the standard. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they're, they're, they're Dave Grohl taking his barbecue yeah. and feeding feeding the masses. Absolutely. But, <laughs> I love it. But, but the funny thing is that the, the similarities and, you know, the how you pick and choose what image to present, I think, are, are very, you know, and it, it's, again, one of the things that I think makes ancient history and even ancient warfare so remarkable is the the humanity and the fact that there is so much that, that we can identify with rather than that is so different from us. Well, where I think it does different, and I, I've just funny enough, written an introduction to a book about Greek origins, um, and I was going through all of these things that the, the, the ancient Greeks as, a, as, a, as a, a culture regarded as virtues, and thanatos, the whole idea of dying, like a glorious death and all that. We don't think of death as being glorious. It, it, it's, we do everything we can to avoid dying. I mean, look, look, look how our so, – so I'm just wondering, these, these all factor into the side of Erie. Weirdly, um, the 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 sermon on Sunday, gosh, um, just last Sunday was what is a glorious death. So there is still in uh, in Christian society the idea of a glorious death. What a glorious death is is different because obviously it is a is it a it's a Christianized version of a glorious death. So it's you know, but it's interesting. It's still used. It, Lindsay, it lingers in the fire service. I'll say that. Um, and, uh, you're absolutely right. It's been excoriated from every other part. Of, of society. And in fact, uh, and this may just be that I, I hang with other writers, but but when people hear about, you know, risking death, I kind of get wrinkled noses. But but this idea that you go in uh, and that that and that a death on the job, you know, that you get a pl- like that is a good death. And like, you know, we, we get sad about it, but but that's, you know, to die making the grab, as we say. The funny thing is that also happens in sport, weirdly. 
Uh, so oh, that guy whose heart stopped. No, 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 yeah. Murray, that guy whose heart yeah, stopped. Yeah. I know we're yeah. way off hoplites here, Jasper, yeah. but this is interesting. Yeah, I know, um, but I've been, that's okay. I'm trying to think how to get it back to hoplites. Good luck. Um, <laughs> well, no, good no, luck. I think we're, 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 we're very close because we're talking about a glorious death. And, you know, again. Yeah, no, no, I was I was getting there too, but if you get there yourself, that's Very fine. In the news, a professional NFL player, I forget his name, whose heart stopped on the field. This was all over the news. You had to read about it in New Zealand. And the horror... Uh, at the near death there, I, I think was a, a new a new thing. Though, Lindsay, I would say that if that had happened in the 1970s, it, there probably would have been less public disgust. Uh, it is a much more recent thing, but you're right. Nobody was happy about that. But it's 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 interesting because, you know, the glorious death thing, and we have the evidence again of the uh, Demison Sema in Athens, and we've got a couple of these fragmentary marble stelae which record Interesting. Now, the interesting thing there is that they record the name and the dean, nothing else. No patronymic, no wealth status, no, you know, just their name, their dean of Athens. So it's very And if it's the general that they are mentioned separately, remember? The one the one in the magazine, we have one. That, in, in Spartan, on Polymoy, in, in war. Mm, That's it. Yep, Not even yep. a name. Really interesting in that sense that there is this service record. Um, and then, of course, you have the individuals whose family pay for their own. Presumably, they would have been listed on the, uh, you know, the casualty list as well. <laughs> um, oh, and yes, by the way, you know, two steps to the left, you can see my statue. Um, so, you know, there's the, that is a very peculiar aspect. But again, the idea of, and it's something we don't have today, uh, you know, imagine if the road into a modern city, you know, A, we don't have walled cities, but if the road in was all of your glorious war dead now weirdly in sydney the road between sydney and canberra i was about, about to say hours. actually in newcastle actually as well right well it's the two and a half hour drive between canberra which is the in the australian capital territory and it's the capital of australia and sydney the biggest city is a victoria cross memorial drive so every rest stop on that drive is named after a particular victoria cross um winner and so that is very ancient very yes, yeah. you're rode in. It really is. is you share you share stories of that winner, that guy, that guy, that guy, and you know Australia is overrepresented in the in the Victoria Cross. I, I would I would like to point out with some degree of humor. This is awesome discussion, and we are still no closer to defining what a hoplite is. <laughs> oh, well, I, I think the, I think the funny thing is that the 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 academic vitriol around what is a hoplite, when is a hoplite, when is a hoplite not a hoplite, is is peculiar because. It was always termed in terms of orthodoxy and heresy, which is a divisive terminology anyway. And people have tried to move away from that. Although weirdly they are, they're going, this is the new orthodoxy. It's like, I thought we were moving away from orthodoxy and heresy. You can't come back to a new orthodoxy. So the problem is that the traditional view is that, you know, and, and it, again, there's a chicken egg argument because the early argument was that the equipment leads to the hoplite. Then there was the counter argument, the political reform and the, you know, the newly enfranchised farmer leads to the equipment, leads to the warfare. And it's like, well, we can't actually tell because there's a point where there is equipment, but they aren't fighting as hoplites in the modern view. And then they I are. I think you've, now you've got a different one, I think, as well, in terms of exactly what the use of the, the weaponry is exactly. You know, you can't define the aspis in terms of just there being one way to use the aspis. And therefore, you can, you know, I think some people have sort of said, well, an aspis necessarily needs a phalanx and a phalanx needs an aspis. But actually, if you, depending on the stance of your body, um, you don't, the aspis does not necessarily have to cover part of you and part of somebody else. It can actually, if you're a bit more side on, actually just be a, a single soldier. You know, most of the statues, the famous Spartan statue with the, the muscled cuirass, they're side on. You know, they're, they're, their shield covers themselves uh, and they're not, they don't seem to have ever been part of it. And, and the counter, of course, is what Mike just said before that the uh, Stella of the Vultures, which dates to 2500 BC or something, um, shows basically and you know it's it's a shield and spear formation uh, and they have rectangular shields and you could probably argue that you know the roman scutum just does just fine uh, in a similar sort of formation so it doesn't necessarily follow that one follows the other the amazing thing i saw recently uh doing the arguments about um 
Marcus Aurelius's column. Now you just took us away from hop lights, Jasper. I'm blaming you on this one. Was that the 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 the, the rectangular Roman shield is not actually very good for using spear play in a mass formation because you've got to go over the top of it. You can't, you know. And so the argument is that between Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, and so Marcus Aurelius's column, everyone has a curved oval shield. And so the argument is that because when you overlap your oval, there's a gap where you can stab your spear through that that ovoid gap. Uh, so therefore- yeah, but there's endless arguments that the Romans had a you know a more open formation anyway, and then you have plenty of space. Well, yeah, and I think that's the interesting thing now is that there's the argument that a, a, a hoplite armed and as a hoplite with an aspis and a, a dory is fighting in a far more open formation than what we think of as the phalanx. And so the argument used to be that the phalanx as uh, hoplites, you know, the classic view that that Mike brought up at the start is early seven mid mid eighth century bc uh and therefore you know when you look at the the kiji bars those are hoplites fighting the way we think hoplites fight and the newer argument is no classical hoplite warfare actually doesn't begin until very late almost persian wars period so you're dealing with the classical hoplite warfare is actually a really short phase because by the Peloponnesian War or by the end phase of the Peloponnesian War, they're not wearing armor. They're they're you know the the hoplite is reduced to a shield and a spear. No, not even a helm. Not all circumstances. And again, it's no, a no, point. absolutely, absolutely. I, I think that's the issue. And of course, the other thing is that the fourth century hoplite, the Theban hoplite, and then uh, Chironia hoplites, they become more armored again. So it's not a it's not a linear development it's it's a it's a waves uh you know the pilos helmet uh isn't early but it becomes later and it remains but it's also a crested pilos helmet at the outset of the the hoplite period which i'm going to say is somewhere roughly around 600 maybe a little bit before that there or maybe even earlier there there must have been some point at which the farmer who could afford uh the panoply came to prominence. That is, the war was no longer just for an aristocrat and his retainers. That is, there was an enlargement of the number of men who could afford military equipment that was of real effect in battle. And so almost certainly the size of armies increased because if you can arm more men, the, the numbers will tell. Uh, so is is calling those people hoplites or proto-hoplites, is that uh, uh, accurate because depending on whether you're a splitter or a lumper, we, we could just go back as far as we can and look at infantrymen in, in just Greece and say, I see similarities between Mycenaean infantrymen and what they had. They had shields, spears, that was the main weapon, some sort of uh, 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 torso armor. I, is that a proto hoplite? Right. So this is a, a, a great question. Um, and it, and it, ties into what is a phalanx, what is the role of the phalanx. I always like to go back to, and I use this all the time for the Othesmos argument, which we're not having, Jasper, I promise, is, is Tertius. I love the Tertius fragments. And I think Roll has used this in that you, we, it's funny, we've been talking a lot about um, hoplites sheltering other hoplites behind shields. What we don't talk about is light arm troops sheltering behind shields, right, which kind of makes a phalanx extremely difficult to have. And the answer is, well, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, is to be honest, but I, I keep coming back to this idea of evolution, not revolution, right? We have this notion of like, it's one way and then it's another way instead of having, look, I think we, I think we will all probably agree on this notion of, of Aristoid based war bands. And, and I actually think ancient warfare did a really great job. Jasper, please tell me you remember the volume and number of your archaic issue. It's the one with the double page spread showing the Mycenaean war battle with the Dipolon shields. You know what I'm talking about? It's it's one of my favorite. I, th- I, th- I think that is 6-1. Six-one. Yeah, yeah, that is but very archaic warfare into early hoplite. Yeah. Jasper's, that was six Jasper's one. Uh, uh, encyclopedic knowledge of back issues. Mm-hmm. I'm a, look, I'm a big fan of Ancient Warfare magazine. Probably, probably your, one of your top three issues. It's really, really excellent. But it does a great job of sort of showing this period of, of, of Aristoid based war bands with the Promachos coming out in front of the war band, showing his testicles, frankly, um, and, and these sort of individual duels occurring. Um, and then some kind of engagement 
after that. And I do think that there's support for this kind of thing. And then somewhere down the line in the middle of the classical period, we, we don't even know it's earlier in the fifth century BC. And again, Roll has done a great job of demystifying this and, and, and showing us what we can rely on with data and what we're filling in the blanks with our own brains. You do have a phalanx somewhere. I firmly believe that. Um, again, Roll is not going to be a fan of mine for saying that. Um, what is happening in between, which is the question you're asking, Mark, we don't know. Um, but I do know this. In all periods of warfare, it is very rare to see click, 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 and these hard lines. Instead, look, why are Hastati called Hastati? They're not carrying Haste, right? They don't have spears. <laughs> so it's clearly a, a, a throwback to, well, I think it's a throwback to the, the hoplite period of Rome, the regal period. And, and the fact that the name persists, right? Well, the, the, princip the, the principes aren't first. Right. Okay. So perfect example. Right. So, so I, I think that there's something, I see when we look for this proto hoplite, we look for this hoplite ancestor, it's almost like we're looking for a, a, a fingerprint, a snapshot that we, oh, there it is. But I don't think it works like that. I think it's, it's an evolution over, over a century or more that gets us from one point to the other. That's not very satisfying, but that is really how warfare works. There was definitely an evolution. I agree. You know, There's definitely an evolution. In fact, in the Iliad, doesn't uh, Teucer uh, launch his arrows from behind the protection yes. of Ajax's yes. his shield, his brother's shield? It's the tower right. shield and the, the archers coming out from behind the tower shield and then run back for their which, which looks which, by the way looks a lot like a persian sparabara doesn't it probably there's at some point there was there was the aristocratic war bands where you they fought in a looser formation possibly with equipment that looked very much like what we consider to be typical hoplite equipment and then at some point there was the hoplites fighting in a phalanx formation now Phalanx formations, obviously, there's a sociological aspect to them. That is, uh, uh, you have to make sure that everybody's willing to actually stand in line and not run away. That's that's that may, that makes the phalanx much more valuable as long as as will it, people are. You can count on them to stand in and fight. Uh, so and so while the the phalanx looks like a simple formation, it takes a lot more, I think, to get people to actually fight in those lines, be reliable than maybe uh, more fluid battle formations uh, of, of the aristocratic warfare period. Well, two things. One is that the fascinating thing about the idea of heroic warfare. I was just reading an account of Procopius's Battle of Dara, where he talks about there's all this heroic warfare that happens between the late Romans or early Byzantines and uh, the, the Sassanid Persians. And you're like, is that just a throwback to mythological? No. Throughout Greek and Roman history, when we've got these legion and phalanx warfare and the Macedonian, you know, syntagma, and always we get individual exploits. When we look at these uh, funeral stelae in Greece, you're a member of the phalanx. No, no, but I'm giving you a heroic single person action on my phalanx. I'm riding down that enemy. You know, not not me and my mates, we went out to the battlefield. So that doesn't happen very often. So even though we're in a in a, a group setting, we get individual exploits promoted, which is heroic, absolutely. But it's also, I think there is a place within phalanx warfare and, and later warfares for her, heroic I mean, individual but it's, I mean, what you're describing is is what anthropologists describe anytime, you know, when they when they study primitive warfare as far as they can it's you know you get groups of guys just standing across from each other throwing things at each other and then you know the bravest of those groups jump out and try to enforce something maybe have a duel maybe try to grab somebody from the other group it, it seems like that that contrast of those the formations like the the civilization that we've learned and and that old style that 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 contrast always is there. Is always there. The battle over the fallen warrior, the fallen hero, to to steal their panoply, lasts well until uh, souvenir taking in current warfare. So that still happens, and yet it's there in Greek warfare. It's there in Roman warfare. It's there in medieval warfare. It's it's again a common anthropological trait, I suppose. Now the other thing, um, oh, I've forgotten what I was going to say. Rats! Oh, it's gone. No, no. It's like my it's like my, it's like my it's like my microphone's gone off. Uh, no, the revolution thing. Um, I, there is evidence, but again, yes, I'm filling in lots of blanks. When you look at the uh, the story, for instance, of 
uh, Polycrates of Samos seizing power on Samos. He does it with 15 hoplites. And part of me is like, 15? One, five? Really? Uh, how are you possibly causing you know, a seizure of power? And you're like, if they fight in a shield-to-shield -shield formation crossing a street in Samos, that could be a phalanx that a lighter, even missile-based uh, warband can't fight against. They can't defeat it because... I, I, I've managed to do that in, in, in Rome Total War. <laughs> well, you know, being, being slightly larger, uh, you know, I can block a doorway and quite a few people can try and get through that doorway and they won't get past me. Um, so, you know, and I don't even have a shield. Give me a, give me an aspis. I'll hold it for a week. But, you know, and again, we get evidence of that in, in, uh, you know, just wait till those boys start trying to date my daughters. Yeah. Um, that'll be when I have an aspis. But the interesting thing there, I think is this, you know, and there are certain tantalizing points because no ancient source says this is the moment, this one here, pay attention. No one, no one gives us that. They kind of talk. Those are lost. Yeah. Well, they lost sources of uh, lost books of Polybius clearly, but, the interesting thing, I think, is that they always talk like we know what we're talking about. And I, it's one of the most frustrating things in, in sources is, wait, what are you talking about? I think I know. Do I know? You're never going to tell me. Oh. So, you know, that that kind of tantalizing, this was the this was the moment that uh, Hoplite Warfare, and I, you know, for instance, if you look at the Battle of uh, Sagra uh, in 600 BC, there's an army of 10,000 that defeats an army of 120,000 in the toe of Italy. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. But if it's a phalanx fighting a loose war band, it, explicable in a way. But, you know, again, you're filling in so many gaps. And Phalanxes don't win against loose war bands. Uh, I'm thinking of the Alia 390 BC in the sack of Rome. It didn't work out well. Well, well, the Battle of, uh, you know, Lachaim and, and certainly by the beginning of the 4th century, phalanxes don't defeat loose war bands of light armed troops again. So, you know. Or, or uh, when, when did Ptolemy Caranus get his head cut off? The the Galatian invasion um, was that two seventy nine BC. Well, two seventy nine BC was the Battle of Thermopylae. Yeah, it's I ten think. years before that, I think. Isn't it? No, I don't know if it's ten Do years anything? before that. But it's before that. Um, anyway, sorry, sidetrack. Well, no, but it's it's good we're sidetracking because you know we have a few questions from from listeners, and one of them is. Does geography determine hoplite battle? And you know, you were sort of skirting in that direction, Murray, about you know blocking roads, doorways, and uh, uh, and the alia. You know, it, where do you where do you work with your your problematic formation? The interesting thing I think is that Greek warfare is so counterproductive to hoplite warfare that the fact that it develops in Greece is so unusual because there are only a few places in Greece that are flat plains enough to fight hoplite warfare. And so, you know, that's why Plutarch calls Boeotia the, the dancing floor of war. Uh, you know, there, there's there's Leuctra, there's Plataea, there's there's Chironia, there's battlefields there, uh, and they get fought over multiple times. The same in the Peloponnese, that, you know, we have battles of Mantinea because it's one of the few places you can fight a hoplite battle in the Peloponnese. Um, so... It's peculiar that you have this heavy infantry-based warfare developing in a in a country that is so ill-suited to it, um, you know. And I was going to say to your point before, Jasper, maybe we should start thinking about light-armed armies, thinking about ways to overcome hoplites and heavy infantry. When you look at the number of times that their evolution of light-armed troops defeating hoplites, rather than, oh, you know, the, the hoplite has declined. It's like, I know that there's someone thinking, how do we get around the phalanx? I know, missile fire. Yeah, from the wings. Yeah. But then you have the uh, contrast of saying that they need some open space and whatnot to operate as a phalanx and whatnot. Then you go to something like Spacteria, where you've got hoplite forces of Spartans actually surviving against missile attacks on an island. I don't know how many. Um, for hours. It, it, but, yep. you know, it's, it's still, there is an element of success there in totally different circumstances, totally different geography um, to, you know, something that is more, you know, we're saying is a necessity as such. You're also taking them and fighting them in different combinations as such. If you're taking uh, hoplite uh, style warriors to something like Canaxa 
and they're being thrown into a whole different mix there in terms of the style of warfare that they're going to come up against. So they're not just a you know one trick pony as such. Well, although it could not say that the phalanx didn't get to engage the the enemy. Well, no, the no. But I'm just saying in terms of uh, you know the potential of throwing them. You know. Well, Kinex is a most interesting comment because the the Kinex are they fight without losing a casualty, uh, which is which is amazing anyway. That you know, there's not a single casualty. Diodorus, Xenophon, Ephorus are all in agreement on that. Um, but you know, the while you're on the losing such side, such a mess. Yeah, while you're on the losing side. But interestingly, I think Artaxerxes loses fifteen thousand men. Uh, Cyrus only loses five, but Cyrus loses the battle and his life. Therefore, lost the war. Um, One point that, I wanted that, to make is. Uh, you, uh, the, the Thermopylae book that Mike Livingston and I have been working on, The Killing Ground, which will be out uh, hopefully this year, but maybe next. Uh, one of the things we look at is the Phokian presence on Calidromo, which is always assumed to be hoplites. By the way, the William Shepard Osprey campaign book on Thermopylae has this as one of the illustrations, Phokian hoplites holding that pass. is one of the most famous stories out of Herodotus. They were not. They were not. They were Siloe. And uh, we use evidence from the Third Sacred War of all things. Um, from that to that uh, fighting on, on Calidromo, it's not terrain for a phalanx, it's terrain for Siloe. And it, we actually show how that results in the, the immortals uh, outflanking is actually quite a fight. It's not like a, a straight out flank as a result of that. So I do think that um, there's a terrain argument to be made, and it's one that we make very specifically there and one of the most famous. It, it's like a, it's a great object lesson in it that I just happen to have a lot of intimacy with. So yes. Terrain matters. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, there's another thing. That we have another question that you can also sort of um, bridge there from terrain. Uh, were chariots used with early hoplites? I mean, if you're on a flat piece of land anyway, you might as well get a chariot. Or a, and and we seem to see them on pottery. Well, so so again, this is the evolution revolution issue. Um, now, I certainly I don't know of any examples of chariots except for scythe chariots. Uh, being used in the classical period. I mean, certainly we, we in Agesilaus's campaigns in Anatolia, we see side chariots being used by the Persians against them. Um, but uh, but certainly this proto-hoplite idea that we were talking about with Mark earlier, if we take this evolutionary perspective, it wouldn't surprise me to see some chariots alongside what, what would look much like a hoplite um, to the viewer. But again, if you're looking for a chariot and a phalanx in this classical mold where like, like a a box is being ticked, you know, I think you're going to be disappointed. But I, again, if you have this fluid evolutionary and organic perspective. I think it also ties back into your naming conventions where the, the title stops or the title, sorry, the title continues, but the role stops. And, you know, again, Homer describes chariot warfare as if they're battlefield taxis and the uh, late geometric uh, pottery shows Boeotian shielded hoplites, but also Aspis wearing hoplites on chariots. Um, there's only two examples, I think, where a warrior is mounting or dismounting a chariot. So the evidence that they go to the battlefield, get off and fight. But again, when you look at the Equites kind of argument as well, and the Hippies, the Hippies, they're, they're doing the same thing. You know, we've got the, the hoplite riding to war, dismounting and fighting. Yeah, there are a lot of depictions of apparent hoplites riding On horse. horseback. Yeah. yeah. And so then you've got the issue that we do have Hippas in about eight different uh, Greek polis. Uh, the Spartan one is obviously the most famous, but there are also Hippas at Athens. There are also Hippas in Orchomenos, Thebes, and elsewhere, who seem to be hoplites, but they're called Hippas, which is odd. So they're the knights, but they are in fact. Well, it's not odd. It's not odd. I think it's. I think it's obvious, right? It's. It's odd. It's odd. It's odd in the sense that if you see the word, you would interpret it to mean cavalry. Not if you're, but if you're looking at it, this evolutionary perspective, this whole point we just made about Princopes and Astati, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the interesting thing is, of course, that Diodorus records that the front line of the Theban phalanx is known as the charioteers and footmen. So you've got, now, if you read some interpretations of the Battle of Delium, which is in the issue, that charioteers, they read that as literal chariots. Diodorus is a useless source. Let's reject Diodorus. So it's like, I think they're called charioteers and footmen because they're pairings of warriors. Now, if you take away the role of charioteer and you just say a pairing of warriors, that's entirely plausible for a Theban phalanx. And it ties into later ideas about pairs of 150 uh, warriors in the sacred band. And if you go back even further, the pairing of hoplite and archer is, the, is what Rolls article talks about, that that 
that that hoplite and uh, archer pairing is something we see in archaic Greek warfare, proto hoplite warfare, and indeed, as you were saying, uh, Mike, about you know it's got some parallels with with Persian warfare. Um, and again, you've got that uh, westwards movement of Persian influence rather than an eastward movements of of Greek influence, which which is perfectly plausible. You know, again, I think there's the chariots may have been used as a battlefield taxi. That's certainly the Homeric image, but that's not what we understand of chariot warfare in the time Homer is writing about, but may have been how they were used in the time that Homer was writing. Makes them dragoons. They are dragoons. <laughs> Dragoonoi. Dragoonoi. It's a very rare word in the Greek, uh, but it's there. Yeah, related to gra- Dragunov rifles. And yeah, sure. <laughs> Refile. The refile are very, very rare. You know. uh, yeah. Before we get to, so, well, while, while we're on weapons, final question that's on uh, has come up. How often would a hoplite actually use his sword in battle? Um, do we have any idea? I mean, there's an article about swords in the art, in the issue as well. But that's I mean, that's like it's such an individual question, though. Like, I mean, I I'll tell you this, at least from a reenactment perspective. Um, I much prefer a sword to the point where uh, I'm eager to close uh, or will even shelter behind my shield and take shots until I can get in close. And I'm much more effective with a sword, but that's personal preference. Some of it has to do with my body type. Some of it has to do with my fighting style. Um, It's one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of of literal ophismos is I like to use my muscularity, my skeleton, my mask to body check my opponent. And uh, spear fencing to me relies a lot more on accuracy. And when my when my um, Chris Cameron, who's a pretty famous author and reenactor, who I'm sure many of our readers and listeners are familiar with, is the opposite. He practices um, getting his spear point into the ocularium of, he puts a Corinthian helmet on a rope, swings it back and forth and tries to get the point in. And he's gotten very good at it. And, and that's what he prefers. And so shockingly, he's a standoff of Eastmos guy, not a, a little, I'd much rather get in your face, stand on your neck and and. and stab you that way. So, but I do think that given the, look, we have this promachoi tradition that allows for individuality, even in the context of a phalanx, right? So I do think that probably individual preference govern this to some extent. I, I may be on shaky ground in terms of sources backing me up on this. So I am speaking from personal I don't preference. Think swords, swords are certainly not mentioned. I mean, every hoplite is depicted with a sword. It's part of the, you know, it's not, it's not a defining feature of the, the hoplite. But it, add a step, that, Murray. Add a step. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. They they are they are depicted with swords, and they all wear swords. Um, so it's it's kind of. But when you again, when you go to the stele, the, the funeral stele, it's always a hoplite. Not always. There are a couple with swords, but it's generally a hoplite still with their spear, standing over a downed enemy who has their tiny little <laughs> sword drawn, and it's like it's a desperation last minute defeatist attitude to have your sword drawn there are a couple that's where the not, sword that's is... not on on like on vase paintings they're definitely more no, dynamic sword, absolutely swords on on vase, on vase paintings yeah true. on uh spanish tercios of the 16th century for instance uh the, the primary weapons being used were the pike but the sword and buckler men would come to the fore when in the press when everything got close in and and the pikes were not easy easily deployed they would go to work so i could imagine that once phalanx had closed to the point where you were in face to face contact and maybe your spear got the point got hacked off or or just that is the swords came out and were effective much more effective close in so Possibly that sword weapon, while not being the primary weapon, was deployed as needed uh, by hoplites. And that, that to me would make a lot of sense by just comparing them to how things might have happened in the 16th century. To deal with the sword, should we not look at the aspis and say, does it actually fit with the, the aspis and how the aspis is going to be carried? Because to my understanding, the, the aspis... Uh, as opposed to the sort of the, you know, more Hollywood, you know, I'm going to wave my shield around and whatnot and use it in a swinging motion, et cetera, et cetera. With the actual Argive grip, it's going to be actually much more, you know, stationary on my body, you know, much more I'm pressed into my shield. So therefore, is that not going to mean that you can't, you know, to actually wield the sword more, you're going to have to open yourself up and actually negate the shield. 
more to actually use a sword. So is that not going to be arguing, you know, again, the sword's going to be. Yeah, yeah. but I think the interesting thing there, and this, I'm going to tie it into your article, Mark. Um, the the cyclical pattern is that when you look at the Ziphos sword, it is a stabbing sword. It's got cutting edges, but it is a straight, shortish sword for stabbing over a hoplite shield. But the interesting thing in the fourth century is that we find a lot more copus and macaria swords being used by hoplites in the way they're depicted, which is a slashing sword. Also, so at least in individual fencing, and again, this could just be me. I can't speak to how they're doing this in the classical period, but when I am behind an aspis, that aspis is not stationary, man. It is moving. Um, and I, there are two things that I've, I've gotten into fights on Twitter about this. It's a good thing I don't use Twitter anymore. And I, I do want to defer, you know, when I talk about my, my reenactment experience, it's pretty limited. I want to defer to the Chris Camerons and Paul Bardunias of the world. But I'll say this. There are two things I do with, with, with that, within the archive grip allows you to do this in a way that the center grip doesn't, although the center grip certainly with an umbo allows you to punch. But the but the scutum is really weird in its weight and all the weight is kind of on your wrist. So when you're coming up to hit with it, it's it's exhausting. But with the Argive grip, there are two things I do. And the first is I hook shields with it constantly. And, and if I can get in up on you, I will clip your head with it. I'll grab your shoulder with it. I'm just doing this all day long. And the opening up is not a problem, Mark, because when I'm making those moves, I am here. <laughs> and, and believe me, I got my eyes on, on that sword on my open side and the shield. And the other thing I do is I punch with it constantly. So if I'm up and I'm past you like this, I'm coming back up with the shield like that, or I'm punching with the rim of it like that. And I've had people tell me, oh, you can't do that with an Argyle grip. Yes, you can. If the poor packs is, if the poor packs What's is What's it compare right though? Because like, again, not, some of the literature sort of compares it to uh, the the scutum and say, no, you can punch with the scutum uh, much more effectively than the Argyle no, grip. No, I mean, with, with, look, I, again, like I, I don't want to speak with too much certainty because I know my experience is anecdotal and limited. You absolutely can punch with the rim of an aspis. I do it all the time. And I have, believe me, man, I have knocked people on their asses with the rim of an aspis. Wait, sorry, one more point with the, the Xiphos. If you take a Xiphos and you do this over the top of the aspis and you have a good grip on it, if you if you wrap with it, you see what my motion is. A downward like. stab, you mean. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know, pod- podcast listeners Mike, podcast. can't see you. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, you you can slash with a Xiphos. I'm sorry. I, I'm very yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm not. And I think one of the one of the points again is evolution revolution. We see it as a very static form of warfare. I don't think it was. It was always a. It was an evolving uh, mass. And we think of a thysmos. And I was the point I was going to make to your point, Mark, was interestingly in the 15th and 16th century when phalanx fights phalanx, it's bad war. That's bad. That's not what we want to happen. Whereas for us looking at uh, phalanx warfare, a thysmos phalanx versus phalanx is the pinnacle of war not not bad it's not terrible it's 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 glorious so whereas where, whereas when you're looking at the the phalanxes of the late medieval period it's bad it's a complete change complete change the, 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 the comparison is not 100 percent. i mean what what i would say is the most distinguishing factor or the differentiating factors between the the big blocks of the six uh, 16th centuries and 17th centuries is that you had different troop types within that same phalanx. So you had pikemen, you had uh, uh, sword and buckler men, for instance, whereas it seems for the most part that a phalanx was all hoplites, though eventually they also had in clouds around them, they had lighter troops. But I, what I, I meant to just get across is that somehow in the press of fighting, a uh, shorter, handier weapon, such as the sword, uh, became more useful. And, and and to go to the 17th century again, I believe it was uh, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden who told his cavalrymen, don't charge with the uh, lance because once you got close in with other cavalry, the lances started to uh, point up and were useless. Charge in with your swords and use your swords because the sword was more effective at close range, you, Mark, you're Mark, you're you're right, but it's not for the reasons that you think. Um, it's it comes out of the Swedish Polish War, and it was actually because the Adolfian cavalry, trying a caracol in the in the Mauritian method, were losing to the Polish hussars, who were lancers. It was it was this, it, but but it was to get inside the lances' range. So you're sort of like semi. I only know this because I'm working on a 17th century 17th century book myself right now. But I do I can c- confirm for you, Mark. The reason that uh, the hoplites depended uh, heavily is because they did not have muskets. There were no muskets in any hoplite phalanxes. I am quite sure of that. We have no evidence whatsoever that they used muskets. 
<laughs> well, that that's too tempting. On that bombshell. Oh. <laughs> It's it's been an hour. I don't. I'm not sure we got any further, especially on the question of what's a hoplite. So maybe we'll have to come back to it another time. Uh, thank you all, guys. I think that was a spirited discussion, at least. That was a I good time. It was, it was uh, a really good time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I hope uh, people can follow it um, without the benefit of seeing <laughs> it, uh, and if, if not, just go on YouTube. You can see the movements. So, see you all soon. Bye bye. 